Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here. It's season two, episode five of In Flight Coffee. Don't say this on your check ride. Welcome to In Flight Coffee. It's a great day, Missouri Nation. It is a Saturday. Happy Saturday. Happy in-flight coffee day. Season two, episode five, coming to you with the title. Please don't say this on your check ride. I, I add the please. I add the please in there. Anna, great to see you. Telvin, great to see you on here as well. Good morning to so many of you. I know it is a busy, exciting Saturday, but I am so thankful you've taken the time uh, to be here, to find ways to better yourselves as a pilot, to make a cup of coffee and just hang out. Ron, great to see you. Anna, great to see you. Pete, I I'm gonna open it live. I I'll share the story behind this in a bit, but I'm gonna open that live here in a bit, Pete, so thank you. Susan, great to see you. Mr. Vargas, great to see you. Eric Anderson, first time making it live. Welcome. Welcome to In Flight Coffee. You know how many episodes you have to catch up? Well, if this is your first time live. You've seen all the recordings. Then. Good to see you, Kenzo. Good to see you, Andre, Dennis. Uh, username Flying Dutchman. Good to see you. Hey, let's make a cup of coffee. Then we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about, it's really not just one thing not to stay on your check ride. It's a few things. Then we'll go into a little mini mock check ride here as well. Really, really uh, excited about all this. Some other first timers. Life of Piper Smith. It sounds like a novel. I like it. Um, any other in-flight coffee first-timers here? This is great. Well, let me tell you, normally you're used to seeing me in a button-down shirt and standing here, but today we're, we're just casual Saturday, making a cup of coffee, hanging out. So let's just do, uh, let's do that. Let's make our cup of coffee. Let's grind the beans. Let's say hi to some more people. Hey, why we're saying hi to some people like Stuart and others, um, my in-flight coffee veterans know the drill. I always ask this question every in-flight coffee, and it's this. Where are you watching from and how is the weather? But you're only allowed to use emojis. You're only allowed to use emojis to tell me how the weather is. I mean, we spend all this time learning how to read taps and METARs. If the flight service station would just give us the weather and emojis, I feel like it would make a lot more sense, huh? All right, let's do our, our pre-flight check. We've got beans, we've got water, manifold pressure's good. Should probably put the mug under there. This is why you have a checklist, right? All looks good. Magda's most important job, Clear prop is right. Uh, is Holly's emoji snowflakes? Looks like snowflakes. It's great in Maryland, says Cram. Luis, hello again. Big Lou from Southern Fun with Mike Bennett. Well, well, good to see you on here, my friend. All right, coffee's flowing uh, good as well. Uh, 50 by 60, username, just finished a pancake uh, feed at, at uh, STJ and made it back just in time. Now that you are full of pancakes, grab a cup of coffee, and we're gonna be hanging out here, so looking forward to that. Eric in Salt Lake, it looks great. We're gonna add some water to this equation, make it a, make it a standard Americano. Magda says, cool guy with sunglasses and a palm tree. You're right, Magda, she's right over there. She, she somehow can switch all this stuff and participate in the chat all at the same time. Um, in Dallas, good to see you. Daniel, a little cloudy, but I love the steerman in the background, my friend, every time I see it. Okay, now, who, who can tell the first timers how Jason sweetens his coffee. Just, just for all the first timers, everything else they know and understand, there's really only one correct way uh, to sweeten coffee. It's not stevia, it's not, um, it's not sugar, it's not, it's not anything like that. It is all natural. Thank you bees for your honey. And then you all have to have a spoon to stir it, right? Uh, Tatum's in Omaha, probably hanging out with Warren Buffett today at his big annual meeting. How busy is Omaha right now? That's what I want to know. I saw pictures online. I bet it's, I bet it's busy. All right. Mag, you're going to mount me. I don't have a napkin, so I'm just going to put that there. We'll, we'll just have to clean it up later. I, I apologize for that one. All right. Let's, um, let's sit down. We got our coffee. It's sweetened with honey. We got it all good. Kenzo's in South Florida. Lubbock, Texas is windy. Great. Rain on Coronation. Uh, it is Coronation Day, Mag. Did you know that? I, I, don't, I don't stay up on world events, but it came up on our our Amazon device, Magda, I can't say its name because it'll start going off crazy uh, and everything else, on our Amazon device, I did, I did see that. All right, before we, uh, before we dive into this, um, I, I need to honor Pete and his, and his lovely wife, Carrie. They sent, uh, they sent this package 
They sent this package on expected delivery of December 21st, 2022, and it just arrived a week and a half ago. So, uh, and Pete is here. I saw Pete uh, earlier um, as, uh, as well. By the way, Valerie says she has a secret stash of honey for us, Magda. We, we can go, we know exactly where to go, Valerie, now. Um, Pete sent this. We had the hurricane, so our post office flooded, um, and uh, I don't know, it just showed up one day. We thought it was lost in the mail forever. I had to get scissors to open this. I know Pete, geez, he packaged this good. Pete told me when I met him, he used to work in, in I think he said IT, in, in pharmaceuticals or something like that. But uh, I, I think he did IT at Hallmark, the way he wrapped this thing. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Wow, Pete. Did you really package it this good, Pete? I mean, I'm telling you, he, he was the chief gift wrapper at Hallmark. He had to be, there's no way. This is gonna be good. So if you know me, you know my, my secret pleasure is airplanes and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I mean, that's just, that's just the two, that's just the two. Look, it's, it's, it's even Christmas themed. It's Christmas in May. It's Christmas in May. I love this. Oh, we got a great little card here. Oh, look, this is trouble. Ohio honey. Ooh, this looks good. Is this squeezable peanut butter? That just made my life so much better, Magda. And Smucker's jelly. Look, peanut butter and jelly and honey. I, I know what I'm doing the rest of Saturday. Happy Coronation Day to us. Right, my goodness. All right, well thank you, Pete. I, I am so glad, look at this, I'm telling you, he worked at Hallmark. Look at this nice little napkin and everything here. This is, that's going on our table for, uh, for Christmas time. Thank you, Pete. I will read the card here in a bit after we finish. I really, really, oh, Pete says it's, it's Carrie. It's his, it's, his, it's his wife, all right. I, I, if you say so, Pete, if you say so, I think you're quite the gift wrapper. So, hey, uh, let's talk real quick. So yes, this is In Flight Coffee Season 2, Episode 5, titles, Don't Say This on Your Check Ride. I know many of you are probably past your check ride right now. Actually, does anybody have a check ride coming up? Will you type in me in the chat if you have a check ride coming up? By the way, someone from uh, JTA from Japan? Wow. What time is it in Japan? I can't even calculate. That, that's Somebody give me the Zulu time in Japan. That's, that's far. Rich Prescott, good to see you. Um, who has a check ride coming up just in the nearish future? weeks, months even away in, in the next six months. There's a few check rides coming up. I love that. I love that. Hunter working on CF double I. I love that. I love that. So we got some check rides coming up. Okay, this is good. This is good. Well, let me tell you something. You know it's the year of 2-3 Mike Zulu because it's 2023. It's 2-3 the, it's, it's Mike Zulu 2023. It's the year of 2-3 Mike Zulu. Every month this year we're giving something away. Uh, and this month, our big giveaway that we're doing, we gave away an iPad, we gave away that survival kit that you saw Andre won last month. This month we are giving away a one hour mock check ride with myself via Zoom. So if you want to win that, head over to m0acontest.com to enter, to, or if you just wanna hang out and talk for an hour, that's, that's, that's fine too. But I'm gonna be quizzing you the entire time uh, via Zoom, I'm going to make a customized mock check ride just for you, for your level, even based geographically where you're at and everything else. So you'll really have a lot to look forward to um, with that. So that'll be just via Zoom, uh, hanging out, m0acontest.com. And if you don't have a check ride coming up and you just want to talk for an hour, we can talk about airplanes for an hour too. I mean, I'm still going to quiz you about them. That's just my nature. But uh, anyways, uh, that should be very, very cool. So if you got a check ride coming up, we'll be doing that. Uh, we'll be announcing that winner at the end of this month. And if you have a check ride really close, we can we can get your mock check ride scheduled soon, kind of around your schedule for the winner. So let's let's dive into this here a little bit. We're going to talk about what to not say on your check ride, but we're also going to do a little mini mock check ride here uh, towards the end as well. So just a lot of good stuff coming up. I want you to participate though, as well. I got the chat up here so I can see Joseph Riley, I can see Hunter, I can see Jared Newman, a May 29th check ride. I see Ken Young's with us now. So again, feel free to participate, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you are watching from as well. So looking forward to that. Let's dive into our topic here though. I need you to understand something so important. And maybe those of you who've been there, done that, been through a check ride can back me up on this statement is, your check ride is really just a conversation. I know many of us go into it, we are so nervous about a check ride sometimes. Right? Who was, show of hands, give me a hand wave emoji or type in me or something like that so I know it's you. Who was nervous going to their check ride? 
And, and if, there, if there's not every single person waving a hand right now, there's something wrong, wrong with you. You're a little bit crazy. I get nervous going into check rides and that sort of stuff. It's just some people are better test takers than others, they say, but um, it's a matter of how can we continue to prep for this? Now, I read a stat, I didn't get to include it in my slides here. Uh, I'll be talking about it a lot this month. I literally read it this morning over breakfast. Um, Jason Blair, uh, who has a great name and is a good friend of mine, um, wrote an article for, it's on it's the front of GA News um, right now, that 2022 was the first year that check ride, uh, check ride pass rates dropped. We were, since 2015, we we're on this climb of private, commercial, and CFI check ride, the first time passing percentage actually climbing. CFI was as low as like 68% at one point in like 2015. Can you imagine a, a first time um, pass rate of only 68% on a check ride? Like that's a, that's a tough one. So if you're a first time check ride passer for CFI, golf clap for you all, because um, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one there. But 2022 was the first year, we, we, were, we were on this from 2015, we just saw the steady climb, the steady climb of, of check rides being passed more and more. You know, private pilot got up into the, the 80, you know, 80 percentage um, type range of, you know, I think it was like 85% private pilot first time pass rates uh, at its peak. And we just took this little, not, not, not big, but we just kind of hit our peak and we dropped down in 2022. Private, I don't have data for instrument, but private, commercial, and CFI in 2022 all saw a greater dip in failures. What's causing that? Um, any number of things could be causing it. One thing that Jason Blair uh, speculates, and maybe it just correlates or is coincidental, we're not sure just yet. We'll have to wait till, we, till all of 2023 shakes out as well. But remember coming, we grew through, pass rates went up through COVID, so we can't blame COVID for this. But we can blame it for the backside of 2022 towards the beginning when the airlines went back to their, there's just their crazy hiring, right? A anybody, if you had 1,500 hours, you were gone. I mean, how many people lost a CFI because of airline hiring or a better job in 2022? Uh, you know, Magda and I are, are investors in, in Rex Air here. And I want to say we had like a, in 2022, we probably had like a 90% CFI turnover. Seriously. I mean, we, there are, I walk into Rex Air now, there's faces that I'm, I'm seeing for the first time because we're trying to replace the CFIs that we lost because of this hiring boom. And I just wonder, and Jason Blair speculated this as well, if that hiring boom of having a CFI, losing a CFI, and we all know how difficult it is to have a CFI and lose a CFI, lose that level of consistency. Perhaps that, you know, maybe contributed slightly to a slight decline in pass rates because now we have brand new, C and there's nothing wrong with, I was a brand new CFI once too. Now we have brand new CFIs who you may be their first check ride sign off. They don't know what they don't know just yet, filling that gap of where those more senior 1500 hour plus CFIs are now leaving. Multiple CFIs can sometimes be a good thing, but more often than not, it's a difficult thing and it's a frustrating thing. I've shared the story a million times. I had eight different CFIs for my commercial pilot, uh, my commercial pilot certificate. And it was so frustrating to, I loved the different teaching styles, the different opinions, that, that wasn't the problem. I learned so much during my commercial. However, what happened was uh, CFI one knew, yeah, Jason's not so good at stalls. He's kind of fearful of stalls actually. And that message, CFI one just got hired by you know, Delta, CFI two never got that message translated and they just assume Jason's good at stalls because he, well, he should be at this point in the syllabus, right? and a lot of assumptions are made and different ways of doing things and it just added. Now I passed my commercial pilot check ride, but it was by the skin of my teeth. Thankfully, I've never failed a check ride, but boy, closest I ever came was my commercial pilot check ride um, for, for two reasons. One, eight different CFIs didn't help. Um, and number two, I made the mistake of believing the lie, and it is a lie, and if you've ever heard this, I need you to delete this from your vocabulary, and I need you to respectfully 
correct others. I believe the advice that one of those eight CFIs gave me that said, oh, your commercial pilot check ride, it's just a glorified private pilot check ride. It's just, it's just like another private pilot check ride, don't sweat it. And I believed that. And I studied not as much as I should have. And, and I kid you not, I was sitting across the table from that examiner. And I, I will never forget, and this is in our book, uh, past your commercial pot check ride, and it's actually in the private book too, just for that reason. When the examiner looked at me, one of the first questions he asked was, what are the three types of hydroplaning? <laughs> and I, I don't know what it was, but I looked at him and I said, huh, I didn't know there's three types of hydroplaning. I'll, I'll look that up. <laughs> it was not a strong start to my check ride, and I truly didn't know at that time. There was three different ways you could hydroplane an airplane. I, I, I didn't know that. And, and there was a few other things that, that I didn't know. And, and I teach a lot from my mistakes and, and, and my deficiencies that I made so you can learn as well. But I teed all that up um, to say that your check ride is a conversation. And you need to treat it as that plain English type conversation. Here's the thing. And this is why our check ride books are so successful. And if you don't have these on Audible yet, past your private, past your instrument, past your commercial bot check ride, if you don't have these on Audible yet or wherever you get your audio books, you really, really need to, please. Um, and that's not me trying to sell you. Uh, that is just great insurance for your check rides. By the way, Paul, I saw your comment earlier. He said, thank you. He said, I use your audio books every morning driving to work. That's what they're for. You're walking the dog. Um, you're at the gym, you're driving to, to work, whatever it is, you need to be consuming that. It's a big mock check ride, like what we're gonna do here. I know people that, it, I think it was actually you, Pete, shared with me, even afterwards, just listening to it every now and then, just to stay up to date on this sort of stuff, even after a check ride, it's still so beneficial. We say a good pilot's always learning, are we really doing it? Your check ride is nothing more than a conversation. I know you know the information, Ron G, Douglas, uh, Hunter, Dan Kastner, I know you know this. But can you get it to go from here out your mouth? <laughs> right? Who knows that that's the hardest part of a check ride? Yeah, I know, how, I know how to do a stall, but you're asking me to explain a stall now. Like, how do you get what's in here with both hamsters spinning as fast as they can and get it to come out your mouth? Like, that, that's the hard part sometimes. You know what I'm talking about? Explaining it to another human. This is why I always say, and Hunter, you know this, and other CFIs out there, you know this. I would argue you don't become a great pilot or even a good pilot until you become an instructor. Because at an instructor level, you now have to communicate what's in your brain. And that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting skill um, as, uh, as well with that. So um, anyways, your check rides a conversation. By the way, I see someone comment, why am I coming through as a Facebook user? Um, it's because you're watching in the M0A Nation group, which is technically a private group. So Facebook sees, is trying to protect your privacy. <laughs> That's what it is. So hop out of the nation and just hop on the main M0A page, and then I will happily see uh, your username, if you, if, unless you want to stay private. If you want to stay anonymous, that's totally up to you. Although I could hop in the group and see it later. So, all right, here's my next point, and then we'll get to some things not to say. Um, question for you, um, Dan Kasner. Do you know how to use everything in your airplane? Because let me tell you something. On your check ride, everything is fair game. And let me share you a story. I did not participate in this story, right? But I know of the story because I watched it happen. Um, in, my, in my collegiate flying days, I was already working on my commercial and my CFI at the time. And I had friends that were working on their instrument. And nobody wanted to shoot an NDB approach on their instrument pilot check ride. I, I, and I don't think anybody here watching this right now would want to shoot an NDB approach. There are people watching this right now that are going, what's an NDB approach, right? Back in the olden days when I was learning to fly, when, when Orville was sitting next to me and, and we were working through NDB approaches and microwave landing system approaches, there used to be a thing called NDBs and ADFs. Anyways, they would go into the airplane and they would flag in op on the, on the ADF and the examiner would come out and go, eventually he, he went out, there was a nice gentleman, he'd go, every time I come out here for an instrument check ride, the ADF is always in up. But I come out here for private pilot check rides and it's mysteriously working. I just don't understand why. He caught on to that trick pretty quickly. Here's the thing. 
You have to know how to use everything in your airplane. And here's what I mean. If you, and, and even at a private pilot level, I want you to know this, because we'll get away, people will try to get away with, oh, you're just doing private pilot. You don't need to know how to use the autopilot. Well, I'm gonna beg to differ, because first off, the autopilot could save your life, uh, if you so need to, and you could be asked to use it uh, on your private pilot check ride. Um, another thing, on your instrument pilot check ride, the, per the ACS, you are allowed one autopilot coupled approach. That's like a freebie. If you know how to program, that's your freebie approach of the probably three approaches you're gonna shoot. You're gonna shoot one coupled, one normal, and one partial panel. That's a pretty standard instrument check ride, three full approaches though. Obviously there's some holds and everything else in there as well. And that's pretty typical of what you're gonna end up uh, uh, doing. Now, that being said, you need to know how to use everything in the, in the aircraft. I've seen people show up and go, uh, I don't totally know how to use uh, a Garmin 430 or, or you know, the, G, the G5 or whatever it is. Like, you need to know that, that Garmin or that Avidyne device much more than just direct enter, enter. <laughs> Trust me, you need to know how to use everything in your airplane because it will, uh, it will come up. I remember actually doing my, my helicopter check ride. And if you've ever flown a helicopter, you know you need an extra arm. You wish you had three hands because it's so much. I was doing my helicopter instrument check ride and great, great examiner uh, out of Central Florida actually just came by and said hi, it's Sun and Fun, got to see him again. Great examiner. Uh, and not many people do helicopter instrument. It, it was just one of those things. I was there, I had the hours, let's just do it just to say we have it kind of thing. And we were shooting approaches in the helicopter and he said, listen, I know you need three hands to fly a helicopter, so here's what we're gonna do instead. You focus on flying, but I want step-by-step -step instructions on what to do to load and program your approach and your flight plan. He goes, I'll do it all for you. Again, the examiner will work with you. You can use them as a co-pilot in some cases. Help me watch for traffic. We're doing clearing turns. Hey, you look above and blow out your window. I'll look out my window. You guys can be a team. They're not gonna land the airplane for you unless there's an emergency or something, but I'm sharing with you my helicopter checker. I got to say, hey, hit the flight plan button. All right, now using the big knob, tight scroll over till you get a K. And I, I talked him through that. I was still two hands flying the helicopter, or it would have been like this, I guess. Two hands flying the helicopter, and, and he was helping me with that. Like, you can utilize your examiner to an extent as well, but you need to know how to use everything in the airplane. I love Holly's comment. She said, we took the NDB out of my plane, so no one have to do a check ride in that, <laughs> with that uh, in, in the plane. Yeah, I, I, I get you. It's um, not an enjoyable thing sometimes. So do you know how to use everything in your airplane? So hopefully that gets you thinking right now, like, you know, I don't know how to use that GPS as well as I should, or gosh, I don't know the autopilot um, as well as I should. Even back to the engine instruments, do you know how to use that EI or that JPI engine monitor as well as you should, other than just looking at it and going, yep, that's pretty. Uh-huh, there's my EGT, yeah, it's pretty. That number's good. <laughs> Do you even know what those numbers mean, right? You, you've got to know your aircraft at that level. Um, is, is just, it, that's important to me. Because think about it. From a system standpoint, let's say, uh, I haven't seen Coach Ray on here yet. Maybe he's been here. Um, or, or Holly or something. I'm thinking of Cirrus pilots now, John Johnson or somebody. What happens if alternator two fails in a Cirrus? You should know that. What am I going to lose? Or what should the airplane do if I lose alternator two? What if I lose alternator one, but alternator two still, like, does one take over? Do I lose certain things? Is one more powerful than the other? Does one have a greater amperage than the other? You need to know these things for your aircraft, not just the avionics, but the systems in there as well. If I lose my left mag, am I gonna fall out of the sky? The answer is probably no. That's why we have redundancy, right? But you need to know these sort of things. It's important, all right? By the way, Jared uh, says, Private pilot check ride is on Monday. Congrats in advance, my friend. Hey, can I give you can I give you a piece of advice, unsolicited advice? I should probably drink coffee, Mag. That's a coffee show, right? Here's your unsolicited advice, Jared. Um, I have a brother named Jared, by the way. He spells it differently, though. Um, you're allowed to be on in-flight coffee today. You're allowed to study and listen to pass your private pilot check ride today. But tomorrow is Sunday. 
and that's the day before your check ride. The day before your check ride, Jared, I don't want you to study a bit. I want you to rest. I want you to sleep in tomorrow if you can. I want you to eat a super healthy breakfast. I want you to avoid things like alcohol and anything that's going to slow you down come Monday. I want you eating healthy. I want you taking a nap. I want you to just read a fiction book. If an airplane flies over you, Jared, I don't want you to even look at it, right? I want you to not even think about airplanes. You need to truly rest. You've been in study, 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 fly, 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 prep, prep, prep mode. I need you to take a day of rest and you will dominate your check ride. I know that sounds counterintuitive. I know back in college, everybody said, cram, cram, cram. You're walking to class and you're still studying. Science shows that doesn't work, right? Cramming may help you for rote memorization, but cramming doesn't help you when the examiner diverts you to an airport you never heard of before and you're trying to figure it out, right? You need to, uh, you need to rest uh, a little bit with, uh, with that one. Uh, username Goose Aviation, first off, amazing username. Congratulations. I hope you have gooseaviation.com too. First live, passed by private instrument commercial CFI. Thanks to N0A. You're welcome, Goose, from Maverick. Uh, <laughs> and congratulations to Zeus15511, private pilot yesterday. Congratulations, my friend. Okay, well, let's talk here. I want to share some things not to say on your check ride. And what I call these are as follows. I need you to avoid check ride pitfalls. What is a check ride pitfall? If you have ever in your history of histories been an online ground school member of ours, you have heard me use the phrase check ride pitfall. If you're not an online ground school member, would like to become an online ground school member, mzuratrial.com. That's my one, that's my one sales pitch for the day, okay? Um, truly, the members will tell you that the, our, our ground school members will sell it for me. They do such a good job. Uh, and know the passion we put into that. But they've all heard me say, avoid check ride pitfalls. What is a check ride pitfall? It is where you dig yourself into a hole. Allow me to explain. If you have ever um, been deposed, right? Whether you did something right or wrong, it doesn't matter. If you have ever been in a deposition, let's say, or if you're an attorney, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What advice did your attorney give you before you went to be deposed on that case? They probably said something like, Jason, answer the question, only that question, and zip it. And that's that. Don't give them any more information. You know what I'm talking about? A check ride, although it is a conversation, you need to treat it a little bit like a deposition, where you answer that question, only that question, and you zip it. Let me give you an example of not doing that. The examiner sits down and says, okay, um, Jason, tell me about uh, 91 to 11, which is our oxygen requirements. And you go, well, Mr. or Miss Examiner, I'm so thankful you asked that question. Um, in CFR, that's Code of Federal Regulations, 91 to 11, we learned that we need oxygen. And you go on and on, if we're at this altitude for 30 minutes and 15,000 feet, we're off into our passengers and 14,000 feet. And the reason we have this regulation is because we could get hypoxic. Do you see what I did there? What's the next question without fail going to be? Interesting, what's hypoxia? And then you continue to dig more pitfalls. You go, well, hypoxia is a lack of oxygen to the brain. And um, I read once that there's four types of hypoxia. And they're going to go, that's so fascinating. What are the four types of hypoxia? You're going to go, well, this Jason Schapper guy told me about it once on, on this. He was drinking coffee and talking about hypoxia. And I, I really don't know. Do you see how you set up the whole thing? Like you dug that grave. That, well, I don't want to call it a grave because you're coming out of that grave. You dug that that pitfall yourself, right? You can certainly come out of that, like I said, but you did it. When they ask the questions, tell me about the oxygen requirements, you, you just answer, okay, you know, this altitude for 30, 30 minutes or more, 14,000 feet, a required crew, 15,000 feet, I have to offer it to my passengers, they don't have to take it. And you zip it. You don't even mention hypoxia. If he or she wants to bring up hypoxia, of course you have that knowledge, but do not lead them, or, or people call it like reading headlines. You ever meet somebody that just can read newspaper headlines, but they can't tell you, they can't dig deep into the story? Don't be that person. Don't just give the headlines. You answer the question, and then you zip it. Now, I know everybody here, like Dave G, 
because Dave G's been hearing me preach the four types of hypoxia since, you know, since he was a kid, basically. He's been a member for so long. Um, but don't give the information if you don't need to. Don't dig yourself into a check ride pitfall. I want you to be confident. I love what it's a, just a Facebook user I see. It says, so true. Be as confident as you can. Stumbling will cause them to dig deeper. If they can tell you just have a surface knowledge of something, you're exactly right. They're going to continue to dig deeper. So please avoid a check ride pitfall. Like your zip it. Thank you, Joe. Can, can you all just type in zip it or give me the emoji with the zip? You're going to walk in the check ride, check ride and you are going to zip it. That's all. That's all you have to do, right? <laughs> and Air J on YouTube, he says, I'm so happy you asked that question. And don't really answer their question like that. I am so thankful you asked that question, Mr. Examiner, Mr. Examiner. And did you know they're actually called evaluators now? They changed their name on us and we didn't even know. So they're still DPEs. They're designated pilot evaluators now. They're not even examiners, they're evaluators. All right, zip it. Thank you to everybody. Kathy, good to see you. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, who is who's zipping it. Bradley said, we need the Dr. Evil zip it montage. Uh, Bradley, I, I haven't seen that movie. I know that probably is very surprising to you. Um, but yes, zip it, zip it. Jason Pollock, thank you. He says, good life advice too. Just know when to shut up. It's been great for my marriage. It's been great for my check rides. I mean, it's just, it is good advice all the way around. Just zip it. All right, somebody get me a shirt. M0A.com. Just zip it. I'm a size large. All right. Our next, someone's going to show up at Oshkosh with that. That's the problem, Magda. All right, here's our next thing. This is, this is Holly's favorite thing she has ever learned from M0A. And I, I've, been, I've been teaching Holly since she was, since she was you know, a teenager um, as well. And this is her favorite thing of all the years she's been with M0A. And that is the win card. The win card. Who knows what this image is? Who knows what this win card is? Who is looking at this going... Jason needs to, needs to stop doing graphics and let the graphics team do it. Who, who is, some of you are thinking, thinking that as well. I did make this graphic. Our graphics team would have done a way better job. That is, that is accurate. This is called a cross-country diversion wind card. Wind card for short. And here is how it works, essentially. What I want you to do is I want you, and let's, let's show this here. Look how many have used it on their check, right? I love it. Draw a big circle. Put your, your major headings up there like this, 360-050-090-140. And then do you see where it says GS? That stands for ground speed. While you are on the ground, Rachel, while you're on the ground, Cynthia, while you're on the ground, Mr. Wilson, you all know this, you get your big E6B out and you calculate your ground speed at your cruising altitude on all of these different headings. So if I turn to a 360, my ground speed will roughly be 108. If I turn to one, uh, 180, my ground speed will roughly be 97, right? And so on and so forth. So I then, whether you write this, whether you print this out, um, whatever you want to do with it, it needs to be on your kneeboard. Because here's what's going to happen. Without a doubt, private, instrument, commercial, CFI, ATP, double I, it doesn't matter you are going to do a cross-country diversion of some port, some, some part. You'll be flying along and they'll say, they'll say, Sam, divert me to this airport. And you'll look and you'll say, okay, that's roughly heading 090. I know my ground speed on 090 is roughly 101 knots. So now I can answer the question because a diversion is all about the following questions. How long is it going to take me to get there? And do I have enough fuel to get there? And if I had to put those in, in steps, step one would be get heading in generally the right direction. You don't need to drill down to a course heading with magnetic variations and everything else. Get generally heading in the right direction. Then answer the question, how long is it going to take me to get there? And do I have enough fuel to get there? You do those three things, you will pass your diversion. Obviously, find the airport, land on the proper runway, um, everything else. But I'm telling you, um, you need to be able to do that. Uh, by the way, David said he got this on his instrument check right with a bunch of follow-up questions from the DPE. So this happens on multiple. You, you will make this win card over and over again. 
But to answer the question, how long will it take me to get there, which I need to know to answer the next question of, you know, do I have enough fuel to get there, I need to know my ground speed. And if you are fumbling around with your E6 speed trying to figure out what roughly your ground speed is going to be, it's just slowing you down and distracting you and keeping your head down. Cur calculate it on the ground, do it using a wind card. I'm telling you, DPEs love the wind card. We have many, many DPEs that actually help with uh, quality control and quality assurance here at M0A, and, and they support the wind card. So I'm telling you, let me show it just one more time uh, so we can get a screenshot. It's a wind card. Calculate your ground speed at your 3,500 feet or whatever altitude you're at for all these different headings. So when they say, Jimmy, divert me to the, you know, whatever airport, oh, that's roughly, okay, that's roughly to the north. So I'll grab my 360 ground speed, bam, head that direction. I know roughly how fast I'm going. Now I know the distance. How long is it gonna take me to travel over that distance? I got my ground speed, so that's easy. It's 15 minutes. Do I have 15 minutes of fuel? The answer is yes, of course. We're great. Now you go on to the next part. All right, it's 1836, it's this frequency. Here's the ATIS, et cetera, et cetera. You just save yourself a big, big step with that. Just asked a great question. He said, Jason, wind card versus four flight during the check ride. That's between you and your evaluator. Are they gonna let you use four flight? Very possibly. Um, they may wanna see it on four flight. They may wanna see it old school. Be ready for both. I, I make all my learners plan their cross countries by hand and in an EFB, four flight Garmin pod, it doesn't matter. So they are ready for both, right? And that is truly that important. Okay, we talked about wind cards. We talked about check ride pitfalls. We talked about just zip it. Can we practice everything that we just learned? Um, and let's do some actual check ride questions now. I'm gonna do a mock check, right? I'm gonna do my best to pause and I'm gonna try to zip it while you answer those questions. You're gonna type those answers into the chat. I asked this question to my online ground school members on Tuesday. Every Tuesday I do a webinar exclusively just for our online ground school members. Um, I asked this question and let's just say I'm glad I asked it because there's always room to improve. This is a relatively recent FAA update, and that's why last week's video was all about FAA updates, because I need you on the forefront of, of what the updates are doing. So here's your first question here. How long is an aircraft registration good for? Just type in the number. How long is an aircraft registration good for? I'm gonna grab a sip of coffee and mute myself to help me zip it while you type your answer in. Great answers, great answers, great answers. And by the way, while you're typing in answers, if I for some reason call out your name because of an incorrect answer, I am not picking on you. I'm coming at you from a place of love because I want everybody to get better, all right? So if I call, I want everybody to play full out. If you don't know, type in a question mark in the chat or something like that so I know how deep to go to teach this thing or whatever that is, I ask that you play full out. Um, and again, if you don't know, just tell me, take a guess. And if I, if I call you out, like if I say, you know, to my, my good buddy, Dan Kastner, I say, Dan Kastner, I love you like a brother. We need, to add, we need to add to that number a little bit here. It's not picking on Dan, I love Dan. I want Dan to be the safest, smartest, best pilot he could possibly ever be. Um, that, I'm coming from a place of love when, when we're working on this, all right. So, how long is an aircraft registration good for? Thank you for everybody for your questions and your humility. So, um, this has changed quite a bit over the years. If you've been flying for a long time, I used to teach in the original version of this, because it was true, um, that registrations previously never expired, believe it or not. Registrations, the only way they would expire, I used to teach an acronym called 30 Foot Duck, D-U-C. Anybody remember that? Anybody watch the ground school way back then when I taught that? It was, it was relevant back then, it's no longer relevant today. But basically, the only way for a registration to expire was you exported it, it was destroyed, you canceled it, right? There's an accident, that kind of stuff. Um, then the FAA said, wait, we've got all, we're gonna run out of end numbers one day. <laughs> like, we've gotta start refilling the end numbers. So uh, then they came out with a number, and then another number, and now registrations, they finally extended them. You ready for this? 
This is on the news and highlights section of the FAA homepage even right now. The FAA is extending the duration of aircraft registration certificates from three to seven years, effective January 23rd, so not too long ago, January 23rd of 2023. Aircraft registrations now expire every seven years. It's five bucks. It's not about the FAA trying to get more money from you. It's about them wanting to know like, hey, when is this tail number gonna expire so we can put it back in the database and let somebody else have it if they want, right? This is why, again, I love that you're here on a Saturday. How many of you just learned something right there? Was that worth your Saturday right there? Please don't show up to a check ride and say they never expire or three years. Those used to be true, but the truth is now it's seven years as of January 23rd, 2023, right? So just keep that in mind if you're showing, and this is in the US, and I know we have Jordan and, and even Telvin and many others that, that fly uh, you know, in other countries uh, sometimes, not always in the United States. So just remember that's the US. If you are, saw someone in Japan, in France, in Germany, et cetera, I'm talking US aircraft registrations. So when you come here to do your equivalency, to earn your FAA certificate, now you know um, as well with that, okay? So good, good stuff um, um, with, uh, with that as well. All right, let's do, uh, let's do the next one here. This is gonna be like a commercial pilot level question, all right? Commercial pilot level question. I don't want an explanation. I want you to just name them. Name the four left turning tendencies. Name the four left turning tendencies. All right, now, how many of you in your mind right now are going, what do you mean there's four left turning tendencies? <laughs> how many of you are going, just give me a question mark if you have no clue. Um, maybe you can name one of them, right? Um, name the four left turning tendencies, if you can. And I'm not looking for spellings. Some of these are really, really tough, tough spellings uh, as well. I'm gonna grab a sip of coffee. Tatum, smarter than the average bear. I like it. Um, Kathy MacArthur, my favorite Kathy. Of all the Kathys, she's my favorite. Um, three out of four, we'll work on, we'll work on the one. We'll work on the one. Holly, great. Isabel, that's one of them. Do you know the other three? Patrick, it's pretty good. That's pretty good. We're missing one, I feel like, Patrick. Um, is it Joy Ten, Patel? Good job. Isabel, that's another one. Daniel, that's one. Telvin, smarter than the average bear. I like it. Does anybody know the actual name of, so I'll give one away. Some of you are mentioning P factor and you're right. Does anybody know the actual, the real name of P factor? You know, there you go, Kathy, you got it. Does anybody know the real name of P factor? And not calling it propeller factor. P factor is short for propeller factor, but it has an actual scientific name. Um, and Josh is the closest, it, but, but slipstream is not the word. Asymmetrical is the word. Asymmetrical is the first word. Um, uh, Telvin, asymmetrical is the word, but it's not thrust. It's not slipstream. Uh, Alexander got it. Asymmetrical propeller loading. I mean, if you want to really impress your friends one day and go, wow, I was flying the other day, and the asymmetrical propeller loading just caused me to have such, uh, so much right rudder. <laughs> if you really want to impress your friends, that's... I mean, if you're looking for a good username on YouTube, I bet asymmetrical propeller loading is probably available, like Goose was available. All right, what are the four left turning tendencies? Uh, I'll show you real quick here. Matt, will have to take it on the chat real quick because I made a full screen slide here. There's four left turning tendencies. You need to know the names, commercial pilots and CFIs and above, you need to know how to explain them. They are the following. Torque or the torque effect as it's sometimes called. P factor, propeller factor, or asymmetrical propeller loading, which is our descending blade creates a larger angle of attack. Then we have gyroscopic precession, and this is all our rigidity 
in space, right? This is, if it's something, I don't have anything to spin other than, um, this is, uh, this is Pete's PB&J he sent me. Um, if, if my peanut butter and jelly, or my peanut butter propeller is spinning, and a force is applied here, let's say, like that angle of attack, it's actually felt 90 degrees in the direction of rotation. That's our gyroscopic precession. There's good videos on YouTube explaining it using like a bike wheel. Really great to see it. Your top will, will show it as well um, with its rigidity in space. And the last one there was your spiraling slipstream. Your spiraling slipstream, let me go grab two things like Zulu. Your spiraling slipstream says, I've got this, this slipstream that comes back around 2-3 Mike Zulu, around 2-3 Mike Zulu, and ends up actually hitting my vertical stabilizer. And it, what it does is when that slipstream from my propeller comes all the way like a ribbon around my fuselage and goes ba-boom, hits it, and watch, turns me to the left. It's a left turning tendency. So we often make the mistake and just call everything, um, we, call, we, we call everything um, P factor or everything, well, P-factor is one of four types of left turning tendencies. By the way, if you need to see more of that, and my ground swimmers knows we have a great left turning tendencies lesson in there where I do 3D animations of all this. I'm breezing through it relatively quickly because I'd like to stop at the top of the hour for everybody. So let's keep going. Uh, I'm gonna do a, um, I'm gonna do a, my next question kind of written test style, so y'all can just type in A, B, or C. If, ready? If a standard rate turn is maintained, how much time would be required to turn to the left from a heading of 090 to a heading of 300? If a standard rate turn is maintained, how much time would be required to turn to the left from a heading of 090 to a heading of 300? Get your answers in there. And ta, um, T. Talsworth on YouTube. You're, you're right. Um, I'll show that in a second here. But let me answer this question first. Run me to come back to the torque effect. Bas well, I'll just explain it to you. Yes, torque effect, when you, um, when you first give it full power, it's the torque effect that pulls you to the left. It, that's the only left turning tendency working on the ground from zero to like 10 knots. right? And what that actually is is the downward thrust of it all puts more weight on the left main wheel and kind of rolls you that way, if that's what you mean um, with that. All right. I see lots of correct answers like Eric Anderson, like Dave Broskow, like uh, Dave Earhart, like Spencer Housley. Lots of right answers here. All right. Don Move, you're very correct. You ready for this? The question says, if a standard rate turn is maintained, so we have to know how many degrees per second a standard rate turn is to be able to answer this question. So you have to know that first. And, and Dave G um, has already created a, an entire program to calculate right there in the chat for you as well. His formula, his, his, his uh, Bitcoin robot did it for him. Um, if a standard rate turn, I just, I like picking, Dave's really, really smart, so I like picking on him, you know, because I want to be smart when I grow up. If a standard rate turn is maintained, so how many degrees per second is a standard rate turn? How much time would be required to turn to the left from a heading of 090 to a heading of 300? Your answer is Charlie. C, 50 seconds. Let me show you the math. Let me download Dave G's formula real quick. All right, there it is. <laughs> 50 seconds. So a standard rate turn means what? It means an airplane is turning at a rate of three degrees per second. Three degrees per second. So a left turn, if you put in B, by the way, the reason you were incorrect is you went to the right when you should have went to the left. And you better believe the FAA knows that and they put that answer in there. So if you put in B and you go, I did all this, Jason. Yeah, but you turned to the right when it said to the left, right? So you gotta think about that as well. Make sure you're turning in the right direction if you put in B. That's a common, common mistake. So a left turn from 090 to 300 is a total of 150 degrees, so 90 degrees to north, and another 60 to 300. Thus, at a standard rate, it would take 50 seconds. 150 degrees divided by three seconds. This is why I need you, this is, and now I'm preaching for the written test, you gotta slow down and read the questions. 
because you could have done all the right math, but you turned to the right. You know, and, and 40 seconds was the answer, I believe, to the right, and the answer was there. And you thought you were right. And you said, what do you mean C, Jason? How'd you get that? Just gotta go the right direction. Slow down on your check ride. Slow down on your written test. Make sure you know what's truly being asked of you. All right, let's stick with this turn theme real quick. During a constant bank level turn, what effect would an increase in airspeed have on the rate and radius of turn? I'm gonna zip it. I don't wanna lead you anymore. I'm gonna zip it for 10 seconds. Y'all type your answers in. You can read it yourselves as well here as well. Dave G gets credit for not only the first answer, but also the first correct answer as well. Good job, Eric Anderson. Username Siegfried, yes. Tatum, yes. Hey, Bill Campbell, good to see you. You're right, Bill Campbell, and reading some good books lately. I can't wait till we can hang out again and tell you all about them. Seton, yes. Robert, yes. Keith, yes. Um, again, Joyton, I hope I'm saying that right. You're correct. Jared Newman, great. Jordan, yes. Mickey, yes. Telvin, yes. Jonathan, yes. Good, good, good. All right, one more sip of coffee. Dan Kasner, you're right. Joe Cunningham, you're right. And they'll be ready. G, you're right. Jason Smith said, for sure. And you are for sure right. Okay, let's leave this slide up for a second, Magda. During a constant bank level turn, so I'm, in a, I'm a constant bank. They don't say left or right. That part doesn't matter. Now, some, how many of you are looking for left or right? Okay, you're constant banks. You're not changing. Basically, if you are in, think of it this way. John Dela Cruz, I'm going to pick on you for a second because I love you like a brother, and I hope to be half as strong as you are when I grow up. He said, these always confuse me. Let me, let me give it to you in plain English, Mr. Dela Cruz. You're in a standard rate left turn cruising around Delaware, you give it more throttle. You increase your airspeed. What effect is that going to have on your rate? What is rate? Rate is my, my frequency. How many turns will I make in the, in the same 60 seconds, let's say? And my radius is how large will that be? Well, you can't have both right? You're either going to decrease my rate and increase my radius, or the opposite is true. Uh, you're going to increase your rate um, and then decrease your radius. You, you, so you need to read the questions like that. Like, think of it this way. A is not, okay, I don't want to say it's not physically possible. You could, maybe there's some supersonic jet that can pull this off, but think of A, not in your, not in two, three Mike Zulu, not in any aircraft you guys are flying. A is not physically possible. To in my rate of turn, meaning my frequency, how many turns I can make, and my turns would get bigger. A is not even physically possible. You cannot go and have a bigger circle and go around it that much more, right? It just, it's uh, maybe in a helicopter, <laughs> maybe in some other things, right? It, it doesn't even make sense. You look at B and you go, okay, well, let's, th let's think of B. My rate would decrease, okay, so my rate would decrease. My How many turns I'm making would decrease, okay, but my, my radius, the actual circle, would get smaller. Well, that doesn't make sense because I'm increasing my speed. That doesn't even make sense either. So you have to look at C and go, oh, my rate would decrease, why does my rate decrease? Because my radius increases. Let me show this to you. This is straight from the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Look at the image to your left. That's what, the image to your left, John Dela Cruz, um, is exactly what we're talking about here. At 60 knots, I can make much, you know, much smaller turns, right? My, my radius versus 90 knots, well, I'm going that much faster. I'm making bigger radius turns. And therefore, I may be going faster, 
my rate, my frequency, how many turns can you make in 60 seconds, right? That's what essentially it's saying. You gotta think about that one, all right? And then, to the right, they can ask this question another way. They can say, now, John, you've got a constant airspeed. You're gonna hold 90 knots, but you're gonna increase or decrease your angle of bank. What does that do to your rate in radius? Airspeed stays the same, but I bank more, 30 degrees, or bank less, 10 degrees. Do you, do you see what I mean there, all right? So um, hopefully that makes sense. But when you, and that was an actual written test question. It wasn't even tech, I mean, this will come up on a check right, of course, but that was actually a, uh, a written test question. You need to eliminate, like some of those, A, is not even physically possible for a 172. Again, maybe you're flying an F-35, then yeah, that probably could happen, <laughs> you know, because thrust greatly exceeds everything on that aircraft. So that's that. All right. Listen, I know, I know we've been going over a lot. Um, type in me in the chat if you are still with me. I, I, know, I know we're coming up towards the top of the hour. i got a few more questions. If, just, just so I know you're still engaged, you're still with me, let me know that you're here. Give me a wave, type in me. Let me know that you're enjoying this, just so I know you're still out there because I, I know this is a lot. I know sometimes we get into the weeds, but I'm telling you, we need to get into those weeds. One thing I hope you know about M0A is we are real world prep in everything that we do. You know, our private pilot course is 29 hours of video. It's the longest course on the market. There is no, I don't think there's a competitor that even comes close. And that doesn't include quizzes or anything. That's 29 hours of seeing Jason. I apologize. But we go deep in everything because I want you to walk away with such a deep real world understanding of that. All right, so everybody's good. Everybody's with me. Don't say with you, though. Remember, we talked about that on our radio communications series. I saw that, Holly. You jogged my memory on that one. All right. Don't say with you. Just check in level 3,500. All right. You're still with me. You're still with me. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Trevor. All right. All right. Let's keep going here. Um, I'm going to share some questions that you probably haven't studied in a while and are probably not your favorite things to study because they're so confusing. I picked these questions, Art. I picked these questions, Joe Peters. I picked these questions because they're not the fun questions that everybody likes to answer and study. They're actually complex, and I love, and hopefully we've done that today over this hour, taking complex subjects and broken them down in plain English. So here's your question. Define an aircraft accident. Define, someone commented with you, that reminds me of my instructor. <laughs> Don't tag your instructor. Define an aircraft accident. Define it. How, and by this I mean per the FAA, per the NTSB, if you go to your hymnal of, of the FAR AIM and you open up your hymnal to NTSB 830, you will learn exactly how the NTSB and the FAA define an aircraft accident. All right, define an accident. There's like a whole acronym for this. There's all sorts of stuff. That'd have been bad, huh, Magda? I almost spilled my coffee. Um, define <laughs> aircraft accident. I'm making a mess over here. I'm gonna grab a sip of coffee, you type it out. Define it. By the way, if you are, if you are absolutely loving this, and, and you, you're thinking of a friend at your flight school, your flying club that needs to hear this. This will be recorded. So hit that share button and send it to them as well. Uh, this will post as a recording as soon as we're done here. Uh, so they can still see it even if they don't catch it live. But by guarantee, you know somebody at your flight school that needs to hear this because they got a check ride coming up. All right. Define an aircraft accident. What's an accident? Douglas, you're kind of close. John Dela Cruz, you are actually very, very correct on that one. I know it seems so simple, but you're very, very correct. Um, Brian says, I feel like this has something to do with coffee. Should I give the coffee analogy? I will, Brian, you're right, I will. You can't do that. Joe Tan, um, yeah, yeah. Well, we're gonna define some of that. Cynthia, you're getting ahead of yourself. You're, you're not wrong, but you're getting a hair. Cynthia Glenn, you're getting just a hair ahead of yourself. It's not quite a check ride pitfall, but it'll make sense here in just a bit. Manny, great job. Great profile picture too. I like it. Looks like Manny, Manny ran for 
for state senator in that picture. That's a good, pic good profile picture. I I'd vote for Manny. He looks like a good guy. All right. <laughs> I'll, uh, like you said, something that's not an incident. A and you're not that far off with that one either. Okay, let's leave the slide up here, Magda. Define an aircraft accident. You ready? An aircraft accident is an, uh, this is copy paste from NTSB 830. An occurrence associated with the operation of an aircraft, which takes place between the time any person boards the aircraft with the intention of flight, and all such persons have disembarked, and in which any person, here you go, this is where you're right, John Dela Cruz, any person suffers death, serious injury, or which the aircraft receives substantial damage. Do you see, Cynthia, what I meant there where you got a little bit ahead of yourself? You defined, in this case, serious injury, I believe is what it was. The definition of an accident is I have the intention to fly from the time people board to the time people disembark, and there is death, serious injury, or substantial damage. Plain and simple. That's it. Now, obviously the question is, well, go ahead and define serious injury, right? That's the next logical question in this, right? And you're exactly right, Cynthia. Death, serious injury, subst substantial damage, and zip it. Because if you don't, here's your next question. Define serious injury. You already did this, Cynthia. I believe that was what you defined earlier. There's so many comments, I missed it. But define serious injury. And your minds will get a head start because the next question I'm asking after this is define substantial damage, right? This is what you need to know. Now, the example they give is intention to fly. If somebody is walking around your airplane and trips over the landing gear and breaks their arm, it's not an accident. I didn't have the intention to fly, <laughs> right? You have to think of it that way. Intention to fly to the time they disembark. All right, they experience death. We don't need to define that. Serious injury, please define that, and then the next one will be substantial damage. Define serious injury. All right, um, some of you are giving me some close stuff here. Let me just explain it to you. Let me just show it to you here, but rather than make you type a lot. By the way, Brandon said this was a commercial written question for him. I love it. This is why we're doing this sort of stuff, okay? Here's serious injury. Grab a screenshot of this, you ready? Serious injury is an injury which requires hospitalization for more than 48 hours, and this is within seven days from the date the injury was received. Let me pause there. Come back to me just for a second, Magda. 48 hours cumulatively within seven days. There's, there's an accident. Um, I go to the hospital. I'm only in the hospital 12 hours. I go home. Six days later, I get a brain bleed. I go back to the hospital. I, I'm now there more than 48 hours, or, or I'm there 36 hours. I've now been cumulatively in the hospital for 48 hours in seven days, right? That now is defined as a serious injury. It's now an aircraft accident. It was not an accident up until that point. Do you follow me? So let's show that slide again. Any injury which requires hospitalization for more than 48 hours commencing within seven days, the date the injury was received, results in a fracture of any bone, with the exception of what they call simple fractures, fingers, toes, nose, right? Fingers, toes, nose. So I gave the example. Someone's out by my airplane, trips over the landing gear and breaks their arm. The airplane's tied down, the chocks are on. I'm not flying that day. I'm not taking that kid flying. That's not an accident. Dude broke his arm, <laughs> right? It's unfortunate, but it's not. You don't need to call and inform the NTSB within 10 days or, or immediately, dependent upon it, right? Okay. Now, next, causes severe hemorrhages, nerve, muscle, tendon damage, involves any internal organ, involves second or third degree burns, or any burns affecting more than 5% of the body's surface. You could have big first degree burns as well. This is all found in NTSB 830. Let me be truthful with you. I, nor your evaluator, that's your check, right, your GPE, are expecting you to memorize all of this. But you better have a tab on NTSB 830. 
you better, you need to memorize what an accident is. That's easy. Death, serious injury, substantial damage. Then you can go to NTSB 830 and say, you know what? It's a big list of stuff. And I have it highlighted here. I'll define it from you right from the far end, please. You don't have to know everything, but you have nowhere to find it. So just be ready to do that as well. So you know your next question. Your next question is this. Define substantial damage. Define substantial damage. Uh, don't, you know, don't type it in. It's fine. I'm just going to show it to you right here. Because this gets into what Rannick asked about property damage. Ready? Substantial damage. This is substantial damage. Substantial damage means damage or failure which adversely affects the structural strength, performance, or flight characteristics of the aircraft and which would normally require major repair or replacement of the affected component. Uh, engine failure or damage limited to an engine if only one engine fails or is damaged. Bent fairings or a cowling, dented skin, small punctured holes in the skin or fabric, ground damage to the rotor or propeller blades, and damage to landing gear, gear wheels, tires, flaps, engine accessories, brakes, or wingtips are not considered substantial damage for the purpose of this part. Read that again from the engine failure. Engine failure or damage limited to an engine if only one engine fails, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is not considered substantial damage. Huh. This is why you'll sometimes read NTSB reports where an engine quits and you go, why did the NTSB not even show up to investigate? Right? They don't define it as substantial damage. Substantial damage is flight control malfunctions and failures, uh, fires in flight. Like it's the, the big, big stuff. You can find it all in NTSB 830, and you need to be familiar um, with this, okay? Um, know what an accident is, death, serious injury, substantial damage. When, not if, when they ask serious injury or substantial damage, you can certainly rattle a fuel off and say, listen, um, I want to be very correct with this. I want to show you. I've read this before. I have it highlighted and tabbed here. I want to read to you the entire uh, definition of it to show you I know how to use my FAR aim. I know how to look stuff up. Right? I know when, when immediate notification is required. Do you, do you follow me with this? You know, I give the example in past your private pilot check right the book of um, your, you charter an aircraft, um, let's say. Let's not use charter. Let's stick with part 91. Let's say you own the jet uh, and you're a passenger on it and you have a flight attendant and... Uh, he or she comes to bring you a cup of coffee. You're, you're taxiing out right now. They're bringing you coffee, and the pilot has to get in the brakes real quick, and they spill the coffee all over you, and it causes second-degree burns to 6% of your body, let's say, just to put numbers to it. Is that an accident? And going back to our definition of a serious injury, which an accident is death, serious injury, substantial damage, involves second or third degree burns. Check, plus burns more than 5%. Check. Yeah, just getting a cup of coffee spilled on you with an intention to fly. It's a silly, silly example, um, but it's technically defined as an accident. Do you, do you follow me with that? Now, first and foremost, uh, and Katie, I'll get to your question in just one, one second here. Um, how'd you do? Did anybody learn something here today? We are, we are, I'm, I'm wrapping up. I'm eight minutes late. We're going to do questions right now. Did anybody learn something today? Type in me in the chat. And after that, it's question time. Any questions you have? And again, I hope you see this and you go, man, I need to join this M0A online ground school, whatever it is. Again, m0atrial.com um, for you to uh, hop in and, uh, and check out a two-week trial of the courses as well. If you learned something today, let me know, and then ask your questions as well. I'm answer Katie's question while you all do that. Uh, Katie asked, Jason, do you have any tips, suggestions on how to find information quickly during a check ride? I find I struggle and take a really long time. Katie, that's, that's probably your own opinion, if I had to guess. Um, you just feel rushed. And in an airplane, you should never feel rushed. If you're far aimed though, Katie, and you're P-hack, and eat, listen, even past your private pilot check ride is a fair game book to bring into the check ride. If it's about airplanes, you need to bring it in on your check ride. 
you know, kids used to make fun of me at my old flight school. I used to show up with a milk crate full of all my books um, and say, listen, I, I don't know everything in these books, but I know where to find the answers. And all of them were tabbed and well used. Make sure your farine is tabbed, sticky notes, highlight it, um, and, and make sure you're consuming this book. This is going to help you so much because in this book too, Katie, we reference uh, where it is as well in the far end to help you with that. You're probably not going slow. You probably just think you are. Tatum said, can I use my computer for a PDF version of the P-Hack? Yeah, absolutely. You could have it on your computer. You can have it on your iPad. And Katie, that might be helpful. You know the far aim comes as a PDF too, Katie. You can download it as a PDF in whatever ebook reader you use or write in ForeFlight if you want to. And just do Command F and do a quick search for aircraft accident and search your far aim that way if it makes you feel a lot better as well. All right. Um, they are all, Chris said, are any of them available on Audible? They are all available on Audible. Just search Jason Shepard or, or type in the book, pass your private pilot check right, pass your instrument pilot check right. Um, also our blueprint, we have four books on Audible right now. The blueprint and all three check right books are on Audible just so you can keep learning, keep growing. Um, and we are working on another Audible release as well of Aviation Mastery in the near future. So uh, that will be good. Uh, Joyton asks, do DPEs typically agree to a check ride and experimental? Sometimes. Not every DPE will, will do it in an experimental. Most of the mainstream experimentals, yes, like an RV, they will. Um, but there is a rule in DPE land that the DPEs must have five hours in that type of aircraft in order to do a check ride in it. When I first bought the Technum Twin, we were in the first ones delivered here in America. It was very hard to find. Actually, I couldn't find a DPE to do multi-engine check rides in it. I had to take a DPE up, pay him for five hours of flying him around so he could check the box to say he was legal to do check rides in it. He was happy too. He learned a ton about the airplane. Um, but yeah, so you got to think about that. If you have a very unique experimental, it might be challenging. However, DPEs are no longer limited geographically. DPEs used to only, like if someone was in the Orlando FISDO, they used to only be able to travel around the Orlando FISDO area generally. Now DPEs can hop on a plane and travel. So you might have to think outside the box and find somebody and pay to bring them in and put them in a hotel if it gets to that point um, as well. Um, username WX4CB, question regarding check ride emergency procedures. I have most of them memorized my little LSA plane, but is it better to do a memory check first than checklist? Yes, my friend. Flow check from memory first, then if time permits, go to the checklist. My flow check is this, my engine quits, eyes closed, I can do it. Fuel selector valves um, on both or switch tanks if I need to. Mixtures rich, throttle check, carb heat on, breakers in, primer in and locked, ignition. Try to start it, crank, 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 nothing started. 7700, 1215 or some emergency frequency. Mayday, 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 this is so and so, I'm over here, I've got this emergency, I'm looking for a place to land. If I have time now, I'm gonna confirm I didn't miss anything on my checklist but you gotta know it that cold. Um, Chris said, are there DPEs out there that are not on the FAA's web server that I don't know about? No, Chris, they're all public. They're all on the FAA's website. Um, so you've got to, they'll, they'll be there. Now, obviously word of mouth, ask around the airport. Some may be better marketers than others, uh, but they should all be on the website uh, as well. Jessica says, my CF double I says, I'm ready for my IFR check ride, but I'm nervous. Jessica, that is, it's totally normal. Uh, to be nervous for your instrument check ride. Listen, I don't know if you're on at the very beginning, but I shared the, the blueprint for an instrument check ride um, uh, with this one. And I'll answer Ron's question in a second. Um, your instrument check ride, Jessica, will be the following. If you have an autopilot, you get one freebie, one autopilot coupled approach. Then, Jessica, you'll hand fly a regular full approach, and then you'll probably do a partial panel approach. There's gonna be holds, there's gonna be vectoring, there's probably gonna be a diversion in there as well. Obviously for the oral exam, Jessica, I hope you have a copy of Pass Your Instrument Pilot Checkride already. On Audible, you're listening to it, you're consuming it. Um, I saw Ron said, pass your, um, uh, pass your Private Pilot Checkride was sold out on Amazon. Go grab, we, it's because we're, we're, it's not, this is not official just yet, but if you want a paperback, um, if you want a paperback, we it just happened this week. I haven't even started promoting it just yet. 
There is a new copy of Pass Your Private Pilot Check Right Out. It is now a blue cover, Ron. If you want a paperback, go find this one, the blue cover one. It doesn't have any reviews yet. It literally, we, we tried to quietly get it out there. Uh, we haven't even started linking it up or promoting it just yet. Um, it, it's great, it's, it's, all, it's ready to go. We just haven't started the marketing behind it yet, so I guess we did officially now. Um, I wanna match it though so we get all those Amazon reviews. Um, the audio book um, is gonna be updated next on that one as well. So the audio book will just be similar to this one. Obviously, you might be able to find a used copy of Pastor Private Pot Check, right? But they'll probably be expensive on Amazon, uh, the red one. Um, but it just updates the new registration, all that kind of stuff um, as well. So grab the blue one if you want um, a hard copy. It's, again, I'm gonna tell you, Ron, it, it's not going to perfectly match the audiobook. There's, there's some new questions in here, there's some updated questions in here. So if you're trying to read it simultaneously, it's not gonna read perfectly. It's gonna read 85% though. Okay, does that make sense? Um, I'm re-recording the new audiobook to match this book. Again, that's why we haven't dripped it all out. I wanted to kind of hit, have this hit with the new audiobook all at the same time, but cat's out of the bag now, if you're okay with that. Um, just so you know, um, with that. And, and again, for those of you that have, oh, you go, oh man, I have the old one. All that's really changed is I updated registration, I added some new graphics, uh, and, and explained some things a little bit differently. It's not, um, it's not life or death. Go on, this is not even on the Missouri website just yet, so you'd have to go on Amazon. Go on Amazon, just search Jason Shepard, and you'll see the blue, the blue cover uh, private. Um, instrument and commercial have not changed yet. We are rewriting those as well, okay? Uh, again, so the, it's not, the marketing on that's not perfect just yet. The audiobook doesn't link up, but hopefully that makes sense. So, you know me. Um, uh, Robert said, will the already purchased audiobook be updated? You know, I, have, I don't know. If you, you've already bought it, will you just get the new one? I, I've gotta to talk to the production team on that, uh, Robert. I don't know that answer, um, to be honest with you. Um, I don't wanna promise either way, so let me, uh, let me. Um, I, I need about a month and I'll be out and ready. Uh, Manny, just passed my written, should I start working on my check ride before my solo? First off, Manny, thank you for doing your written before your solo. Um, my friend, yes. It's time to start prepping for the check ride. If you're already in our online ground school, keep going through it. Get the books, listen to the audiobook, everything else. Begin to consume that as well, my friend. That's gonna benefit you so, so greatly um, with that one, okay? That's gonna help you a ton. All right, other questions, other comments. This is your, this is your opportunity, team. I am here, happy to hang out with you all. Um, again, don't forget, m0atrial.com for the ground school. Also, don't forget, uh, if you want to win that one-on-one -on -one, uh, mock checkride oral exam with me via Zoom, it's m0acontest.com to sign up for that, m0acontest.com. Um, let's, uh, let's see, Ranji, that's a great suggestion. I, you're right, uh, I, don't, I, I teach ice flags, but I do it out of order. Uh, I haven't gotten to that part of the audiobook just yet, so I, I will do that. Um, Tatum said, what should I include in a check ride binder? You know what I did for my helicopter check rides? Because it was so different. Aerodynamics and the symmetry of lift and all these different, so different in a helicopter. I actually drew pictures because I knew they were gonna, you know, teach me about the dissymmetry of lift. This was a private pilot helicopter check ride. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna draw all this. Like, because I'm a CFI because it helps me understand it. I brought it in my check ride binder, Tato, I said, oh, I'll show you the symmetry of lift. And I had my graph that I made there, and, I, and my little helicopters I drew, and I taught the symmetry of lift, you know, from that, that simply. So that's just a, a great way to do that. Some of your own drawings um, can help a ton. Um, you know, I did a lot of this in my, my, my CFI notebook and, uh, and everything else, so. Um, that's super. Ray, yes, past your commercial pilot check ride is on Audible. So on Audible is past your private pilot check ride, past your instrument pilot check ride, past your commercial pilot check ride, and the private pilot blueprint. Aviation Mastery will be out soon, and the check ride books are all getting a facelift this year um, as well. Jessica, Mag and I look forward to seeing you uh, again at Oshkosh as well. Uh, again, we will be at Oshkosh, Hangar B. Hangar B, uh, we're right when you walk in Hangar B, right up front, you can't miss us. So look forward to seeing you all. Uh, John, no audibles yet for CFI. I don't even have a CFI book just yet, but that is in the, that's on the roadmap. It's not even in development yet, but it is in on the roadmap 
um, with that. All right, last call. Questions, comments, concerns, anything else? Because um, if not, it's lunchtime. My, my tummy says so. Um, let's see, Joe, Oshkosh 2024, and I'll be great. Hey, we're gonna be flying up to Oshkosh as well. Matt and I and 23 Mike Zulu. I don't know our exact route just yet, but if you draw a line from Ocala to Oshkosh, and you're within 100 miles of that line, reach out to us. Maybe we'll stop in and say hi. We need to stop for plenty of fuel and, and some good dinners and good company. So uh, if that's you, be sure to reach out and, uh, and let us know as well. But um, uh, I'm gonna answer flying M. Habib's comment. Had to transition to G1000 last minute before a check ride. Any tips? Whew. Um, I'm not crazy about that. And I'm just I, I'm saying this because I care about you a lot. Define last minute. Are we talking, do you have at least five hours that you can sneak in? Like five, and I mean like five flights you can sneak in? I don't even like when they change tail numbers before the check ride. Like you've always been flying 2-3 Mike Zulu, and then on check ride day, they switch you into 1-1 one, one Mike Zulu. And it's still the same aircraft, same avionics. It's just a different tail number. Um, I'm not even crazy about that. So switching from Steam to G1000 is a big big um, switch with that one. So five hours at a minimum, my friend, till you go for a check ride in that. You've got it. Because remember the first thing we said, you got to know everything in your airplane. And you got to know that G1000 forwards, backwards, upside down, and everything else. So, um, so that's that. Air J said, can you and your wife write a marriage check ride book? Chapter one. Zip it. Chapter... <laughs> yes. Yeah, you, uh, the most powerful words are, you were right, I was wrong, I'm sorry. And I say that at least three times a day, because she's always right, is how it works. Um, actually, Mag and I post, um, if you want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, just Jason and Magda, um, we occasionally just post some life stuff, some business stuff, some success principles, um, some marriage principles there on a very serious note. Uh, and, and Magda's telling me we need to do some more uh, as well. So follow us on Instagram or Facebook, or YouTube, or all three, Jason and Magda, and Andy Magda um, as well. Uh, so uh, let's see, I, I just wanna grab a few more. I wanna grab a few more, Magda, sorry. Um, she's saying she's hungry. Um, tips for newly hired CFI, says, his name's Jason, I have to answer his question. Tips for newly hired CFI, my friend, your students will only learn to your capacity. So Jason, if you stop learning here, your CFI, your students are only gonna learn about here. Jason. If you are weak in systems, your learners are gonna be weak in systems too, unless they're a mechanic or something. If you're weak in airspace, they will be weak in airspace. You've got to, if you don't have a copy, I'm sorry to be so, promo, so salesy today, I'm not trying to be. If you don't have a copy of Aviation Mastery, the book, that's on Amazon, you can go buy, search Jason Schaffer, Aviation Mastery. Um, trust me, my friend, this is your black belt in becoming a pilot. And it's not just for CFIs, it's for everybody. The idea is mastery is a quest, not a score on a test. Go grab your copy of Aviation Mastery, read that cover to cover. That's gonna help you. A good pilot's always learning, and so is a good CFI um, as well with that one. All right, um, anything else? Last call, questions, comments. If I missed it, I apologize. Maybe copy and paste it one more time. Thank you, John De La Cruz, for the kind words. Valerie, it was so good to see you. Um, yesterday and then see you again here today um, as, uh, as well. But thank you so much. Y'all are absolutely amazing. It is such a blessing uh, to get to serve such an amazing community here on a Saturday. I know it's a busy Saturday. It's, it's Coronation Day. It's the Kentucky Derby. And the rest of my day is watching Warren Buffett's uh, annual, annual report. So that's what I'm doing the rest of the day. That's nerdy, nerdy finance stuff as well. Um, so anyways, that, uh, that is that, but thank you. Um, thank you so much. I will go back, do my best to answer questions. If I missed any, I appreciate y'all so much. Have just a blessed, abundant, outstanding rest of your day. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you.